Here we go. All right. Welcome to the first 2020 Summit Racing Facebook Live session. My name's Al Noe with Summit Racing. This is my friend and coworker, Dave Fuller. And thank you so much for joining us today. If you're watching on Facebook, like the Summit Racing page. You can also follow us on YouTube and Instagram as well. We want to be there for any social channel that you want to follow us in. Uh, today is a very, very special edition of our Facebook Live session. Not only is it our first session in 2021, but we have an incredibly special guest who follows in with the Summit Racing theme of Powered by Enthusiasts. In some ways, you could call him the Chief Enthusiast. Our guest today is Jay Leno. Jay's joining us from his garage in California. And Jay, on behalf of the Summit Racing team, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time to spend with us today. Well, thank God. We really appreciate it. Got a lot of time. A lot of time to talk cars these days. <laughs> Not much else to do but sit around and talk cars. So it works out pretty good. Yeah. I, I, you, so, so on that topic, how's your 2020? Uh, how, how'd you navigate through and uh, how'd things change for you? And, and just talk a little bit about the importance of having a hobby like this. Well, things didn't really change. I, I usually just come to the garage. I mean, obviously, I had over 200 personal appearances canceled, so I'm not on the road. So I just come to the garage and I like to work on my stuff. And, you know, it's interesting because when you work in in a field like show business or something where you're using your head and uh, to come in and work with your hands is very satisfying. It, it, it gives you a sense of proportion, you know. When you take a transmission out and you realize some guy probably made 80 bucks for that and his hands are all cut and bleeding and you, you realize it makes you appreciate how easy it is to make, to make money in show business, you know? So it's, it's fun. It, I, I, you know, I, 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 one of those people believes when the, the head and the hands work together, that's when the heart is healthiest. And so in the day you sort of work with the hands and at night I go out and tell jokes or do whatever it is like that. And, and it, it, it's just a nice, it's, it's a nice balance. I, I enjoy it. My life has not really changed a whole lot because I'm usually here all the time anyway. I'm either, you know, I do the Tim Allen show, last man standing and the Jay Lone's garage show and the YouTube show and a few other things. So, um, the only thing that's really different is the personal appearances have stopped. There just aren't any anymore. But uh, so I come back here and actually I fixed a bunch of things uh, I thought I would never get to. You know, I have a, an old eight liter Bentley over there and it has a crankshaft pulley that spun. It, it, it broke the key. Okay. Now, any other car, you know, like a VA, you open the hood, you take out the radio, you pull the crankshaft pulley. Well, on the Bentley... The crankshaft goes through the cross member, uh, I mean the end of the crankshaft, and the pulley's on the inside. So wow. you you have to you you have to pull the you have to take the body off, <laughs> pull the engine to get to the crankshaft pulley. Uh, luckily, we're able to fix it with uh, some shims and some red Loctite and and to, to hold what the keyway had come loose, so the thing was rocking and chewing itself up, you know. So mm -hmm. luckily able to fix it. So that was, that was good. So uh, just a lot of, just a lot of projects like that stuff. You go, Oh man, this is a nightmare. Let me just put it in the corner. Um, uh, I've got a, a 1942 uh, Jeep army issue. Uh, it, it's a Ford built Willys and it spun the bearings on it. So we, we just, actually that was pretty easy. We did that in a day. We, we, we called a couple of Jeeps, the Blank Roy Fitzgerald and, 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 and got new, uh, new mains. Uh, I mean, they're all shell bearings that, and uh, I just finished that like an hour ago. So that's running time. So actually everything's okay. Can't complain. Can't complain. Good. Mm -hmm. Very good. So Jay, when you look back on your, on your uh, career and your automotive passion, how did you get started? What age were you? When did you see like the first car? And, and what was the first thing that you saw that just got your, you interested in this hobby and, and what started? Well, I was always into anything that sort of rolls, explodes and makes noise. Uh, I came home from the hospital in a 49 Plymouth. Uh, we had that till I was seven years old. Then my dad bought a 57 Belvedere and I used to sit in his lap and, you know, hold the steering wheel going down the street. Now, of course, nowadays they arrest your father and put him in prison for child abuse. But back then it was fairly common. You sit in your dad's lap and blow the horn, and hold the steering wheel. So I always liked cars and motorcycles. And I went through the usual go-kart stuff and all that kind of thing. 
But I remember, this is kind of a funny story. When I was, I grew up in Andover, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles south of the New Hampshire border. And one day I'm riding my boat, motorcycle, on my motorcycle, I'm riding my bicycle rather in uh, Ballard. Andover had another section called Ballard Vale, which is kind of like, I don't say the lower class part, but the other side of the tracks, put it that way. So I'm riding my bicycle, I, I come up the hill, I get to the top of the hill, and I see this uh, 1951 Jaguar XK120 with the spats on it, and I went, oh my God, look at that. And I saw this, what I thought was an old man polishing it, you know. So I looked at it, and the guy said, oh, you like this car? And I thought, oh yeah, can I, so you want to sit in it? This is the days before all guys were pedophiles, you know. Okay, so, so, so he calls me over, and he lets me sit in, and I'm like, oh man, this is really cool. So that stuck with me. And the first sort of collector car I bought when I made some money was a, a 1954 Jaguar XK120. But I never forgot sitting in that car. And I told that story one day, I think on The Tonight Show, uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I get a letter from a guy in San Francisco who says, hey, you know that guy uh, whose car you sat in? Uh, he still owns it. I go, what? He must be dead. He's an old man now. He's an old man then. Well, it turns out at the time, the guy was only 24, but I was not. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, you know, I just thought he was like 50 or 60. Yeah. You know? So I go, what? He's still alive? He goes, yeah, he still lives in the same house, the same place. I go, oh, here's his number. I know him. This guy went to school. And I, oh, okay, so I'll call him up. And uh, and I guess he, what is he? So he's 14 years, what is he? Whatever that is. Uh, how many years old? It's a good good I'm at man. So I call him up, and next time I go back home, I go to visit him, and the car is in the same barn. This is what's great about back east. People put stuff away, and it just sits. And it, it was just amazing to me. I, you know, I had to think in my head that he was an old man, and he let me sit in his car. But he was, <laughs> he was only 24 at the time. So th th that's kind of where I, I got started. Plus, you know, it was also an era growing up in the 60s primarily when – like my mom knew nothing about a car, but she knew when a Valiant wouldn't start, you take off the round thing, take a screwdriver down the little smaller round thing, you know, open that so the flap opens, get in, turn the key. Uh, you know, so people had some sort of cursory knowledge of cars. It's not like today where engines are pretty much sealed and you can't do anything. So uh, plus it was the era of the muscle cars and music and, Cars were sort of cool. Even kids who knew nothing about cars pretended to because the music was all influenced by cars and all that kind of thing. So it, it was a good time to grow up and be interested in automobiles. Yeah, well, I think it's certainly a challenge getting uh, the next generation or the current generation back interested in cars. Definitely a different time. So what keeps you so interested in and in, in, in cars in general, I mean, you work on them, you're, you, you obviously have a, you know, a ton of history on them and, and obviously driving them is fun. What's your favorite aspect of just owning all these different cars? Well, I, I, I like the whole aspect of it. You know, I, I like the story behind it. You know, the car was sort of the iPhone of the day. You know, kids now go places virtually. Get your iPhone, you text your girlfriend, send me a naked picture, okay send a naked picture. In our day, you had to call the girl up, go over to her house, wait till her parents were out of town, somehow convince her to get undressed, take the picture, go two towns over to the Liggett Rexall drugstore to develop pictures where the guy didn't know your parents, get them to develop those pictures. And then three days later, when he got them back, there'd be black bars over all the good parts. So you, <laughs> you, so you, you couldn't tell it, you know, but, but the car, the car was your escape. You know, that's what it, I mean, your car took you from point A to point B. I, I mean, it really, like I was seven miles from uptown. I remember the worst day of my life being 15 and a half. And my buddies who were 16 all had cars. Hey, we'll see you uptown. Okay. I'm riding my bike. By the time I, <laughs> By the time I get uptown, everybody's gone. Everybody's left. You know, it's like the that was the worst age to be because some of your friends had cars and, and you didn't have a license yet. But, uh, you know, I was one of those kids. I was at the DMV, uh, you know, like uh, when I was 15 and nine ninths, you know, just waiting for the clock to hit 12 so I could go in and get my license. So it was a different time, different time. But you talk about kids not being, you know, it's interesting. I find kids are interested in the new technology 
Like I find a lot of young people who are not car people fascinated by electric cars. Mm. You know, it's a bit like rock and roll and rap. You know, it's still music. It's just not the music you grew up with. It might not be the music you like, but it's still music. So you have to look at it that way. I mean, I, I, I meet guys all the time now modifying Teslas or, or taking, uh, you know, old cars, MGs, whatever, convert it into electric. They're faster. Uh, the quieter, they don't pull. Uh, it's just, it's just a different ball game. You just sort of have to change with the times. I think. Yeah, that is true. Jay, what's what is your opinion of uh, electric vehicles? Um, I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, some of the new technology is definitely going to appeal to to younger people and people that are maybe in their teens right now. But I, I'm always interested because. You know, in, in one way, a lot of younger people don't know the history of the electric vehicle in the United States. And I know you, for example, have, I believe it's a Baker that's from 1900, 1910, somewhere in that era. Yeah, 1909, a Baker electric. And people are fascinated to learn the electric car came before the gas car. I mean, there was electric cars before we had gas cars. The, the same problem was a problem we had on two just the last couple of decades, battery technology was not there yet. You know, for new technology to succeed, it can't be equal. It's got to be superior. It's kind of like the Wankel engine. The Wankel engine, well, everybody thought, oh, my God, this is going to be the greatest thing ever, the Wankel engine. And it was fast and it was smooth, but, A, it burned oil uh, more than a gas car, and it got about three to five miles per gallon less than a gas car. So, consequently, it did okay, but it never really caught on. And electric cars, up until about 20 years ago, were interesting. If you knew you were going from here to there every day at exactly the same time. Okay, an I, you know, I have one of those uh, EVs, uh, that, that one uh, General Motors. Oh, the EV1, on. Jay? The EV1. I didn't, I mean, I just, they let me borrow for a couple of weeks. And I live probably 25 miles from from the tonight show my house something like that uh and i find when i when i you know i I'd get on the freeway i'd nail it and i'd see if mileage would go from 80 to oh, three i've only got three have i got i i, I, I was sweating bullets every time i got to nbc but you know electricity is like sex everybody lies about it says it's more than it is and and that's sort of the problem with they never got the range that they promised you know in this ev i would charge it all day at NBC and barely have enough, but I charge it at 110. So I barely had enough uh, energy or electricity to get back to my house. I would get back and the light would come on. I go, well, this electric thing is not going to work. It wasn't until Tesla came along, I think. And I think that sadly, or whatever you want to call it, is the future. I think a kid born today will probably ride in a gasoline powered car about as often as a kid today rides in a car with a manual shift. You know, it'll still be there. You know, I've got a Tesla. I bought it in 2015. I've never done anything to it. I don't do anything to it. It's never been to the dealer. It doesn't break. It doesn't need warm up. It doesn't need fluid change. I suppose I get lazy and change the brake fluid. But even brakes last forever because you're always using regen to slow down. You know, and I, I think what will happen is that hot rods, Mustangs, Cobras, Ferraris. These will become like snowmobiles. It'll be a, a, a vehicle you use on the weekend uh, to have fun, go in the hills and drive around and go to car meets. But during the week, they'll use an electric car to go back and forth. I mean, I get on the 101 freeway and it's bumper to bumper. Why should I drive a Hemi Challenger, you know, at nine to 12 miles an hour down the freeway <laughs> getting six miles per gallon? It's, it's not fun, so why not use your electrical vehicle for that and then use your your uh, your gas car for weekends when you want to have some fun. You, you had a chance also to, to, to drive in the uh, Tesla truck as well, right, recently? And what yeah, was your yeah. question on that? You know, that was fascinating. But, you know, Elon's quite a guy. Uh, you know, when you're a billionaire, I mean a multi-billion, and you own the company, you can do whatever you want. And, you know, I went over there. I said, come, let's go for riding the Tesla truck. So he and I, we take Tesla truck. And it's just like the Tesla car. I mean, very quick, very fast. It's big. And, and you know, it's interesting. Whether you love it or hate it, and I meet people that do both, pickup trucks have looked exactly the same since 1918. 
with the exception of maybe the Corvair ramp side where the engine was in the back, but that was a little too wild for most people. It didn't sell. Uh, but pickup trucks, are, uh, pickup trucks are like 911s and like Harley Davidson's. They don't change too much. The radical change is not good. And this was a radical change. And consequently, half love it and half hate it. I remember I was talking with Bob Letts when, uh, when they introduced the Viper. And I said, how do you feel about, you know, some people thought the Viper looked too cartoony. Others loved it. And he goes, well, that's great. He said, I'm not going to sell it to the people that hate it. But the people that love it have to have it and will pay a premium to get it. And that's the idea. You want to have some sort of passion one way or the other. Anyway, so Elon and I take the uh, Tesla truck out for a ride. We're driving around. And I said, hey, how's that uh, that boring company working? You know, he's got that, you know, that boring, you know, makes the tunnels under Los Angeles. Do you guys know about, you know about that? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yep. Okay, so, so he says, oh, the tunnel's not far from here. I said, he said, and then he says to me, do you think the Tesla truck will fit in the tunnel? I go, I don't know. It's your tunnel. Let's, <laughs> you know, let's take the truck over and see if it fits in the tunnel. Uh, yeah, okay, great. Okay, so we go up to the tunnel, and he gets out. And we have a quarter inch on each side, just barely. So we get in this tunnel, and we're driving along, you know, and we're now 60 stories down. This is not a tunnel like a subway where you're 20 feet below the street. You're 60 stories down. So we're driving along, you know, and and it's it, it it's like one of those cartoons that you watch, you know, where the machine goes through and makes the tunnel that's perfectly round, and that's basically what this is. So this is a continuing process. He's got about maybe two miles of tunnel. So we come to the end of the tunnel. And I go, what do we do? Do we have to back up? He goes, oh, we have an elevator here. At each step we go, we, we take the elevator and we build it. He goes, oh, okay. I go, where do we come up? He goes, I'm not sure. So we get in the tunnel and we come up in some guy's backyard in El Segundo. And we come up and I see a broken bike and a a Weber grill and you know, just what everybody has in the backyard. And this guy comes out, hey, Mr. Mr. Musk, hey, Mr. Lanaya. Hi guys, how are you? He goes, sorry, Bob. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I, I, he says, we, we pay him to use, his, to use his backyard. And we just come up this guy's backyard and we pull out his driveway and we're on some street in a neighborhood in El Segundo. And next month, it'll be further on down the road. So uh, that's what's kind of fun, you know, when you, when you billionaires can do whatever they want. Yeah. And, and that's what sort of makes it interesting. You know, it's the same thing with that SpaceX company. I mean, they put a rocket into space and land it, and they build a rocket in a building that is smaller than my garage. And it's a bunch of guys in T-shirts. It's not, you know, IBM guys with white shirts and blue tie. And they do it for the tenth of a price of what the government does. And the rocket goes up, puts a satellite, and then comes back and lands on this, uh, this raft, essentially, that they have out there. And it's just a ratty old raft. It doesn't look like anything special. And that's what it lands on. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's, I like that sort of American ingenuity. I think it's a, a very clever guy. Yeah. Jay, I, I've often said I think he's the Howard Hughes of modern day. You know, just yeah. very incredibly successful. Amazing. I mean, just an amazing story. I, I, think, I think that's fair. And I think, you know, it's interesting. We're getting like the British now. We... We seem to enjoy people's failures more than we enjoy their successes. You know, when I wa I would watch people go after Tesla and uh, trash it and make fun of it, and I go, "Why? It's American made, with American workers. I mean, it's built a hundred percent right here in California using locally sourced materials. I'm sure there might be some parts from China. So there's nothing that isn't. But for the most part." It's American workers being paid a union wage. I don't get why people get mad at it or, or hate it. You know, I don't have kids, but I subsidize schools. I'm not a big sports fan, but I pay for my taxes, pay for stadiums and everything. So to subsidize a new form of transportation, it doesn't seem that bad to me. You know, people always think if you have one, you're going to lose the other. And it's not. I, I think we'll be able to enjoy our gasoline powered cars longer if people who don't care for them drive electric cars because they'll pollute less and uh, whatnot, you know? I mean, they always say that, yes, yes, there's more pollution to build an electric car. That is true. But once the electric car is built, it stops polluting. I mean, a 1977 Ford LTD parked on the street with the ignition off pollutes more than a Tesla going down the road at 80 miles an hour. 
because the gases, the unvented gas tank, I mean, that's giving off all sorts of things, you know? So uh, it's just something to think about. I mean, you can, you can have both. You can have your electric world and you can have your, your car world at the same time. One doesn't necessarily get the other, but we all seem to get in our heads that if you have this, oh my God, this is going to happen. You're going to lose your right to drive. You're going to lose it. I, I, I don't believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, I, I think your observation on that is spot on. And, uh, you know, I went to a, an autocross challenge last year put on by one of our vendors called the UMI King of the Mountain. And a, a fellow who raced with Akron Sports Car Club, who now lives in the Carolinas, he came to it with a Tesla Model 3. And it's, uh, you know, modified a bit, but not modified an incredible amount. The car was fast. I mean, right, yeah. really, really fast and a lot faster than a lot of other cars that were there. So I, I definitely had a lot of respect. John Lawful, if you happen to be tuned in, credit to you. You were one of the first guys to bring one of those out. And uh, the, the car is fast. It's, it's very impressive. If, if you've never been in one, and this is really for the audience, if you've never been in one, you got to take a look and you got to see. And, and actually, it's funny. Summit Racing does sell Tesla parts. We actually sell a lot of Prius replacement batteries. We want to be able to meet customers' needs no matter what they want to drive, because to your point, whether they have an EV or a gas vehicle, if they're still in the hobby, we want to talk to them and we want to take care of them because it's important and the market's going to go that way. So yeah, it's an yeah, interesting I, topic. I, you know, it's sort of like uh, with truckers, you know, for years, trucks look like big Peterbilts. They look like just non-aerodynamic boxes on top of boxes with a big flat grill. And then I can't remember the company that came out with that sort of aerodynamic looking truck. Remember it had that sort of uh, Buck Rogers ray gun looking uh Oh yeah. You know, how do you say? It? Yeah, and it was like twenty percent more aerodynamic, and all a truck. What a stupid looking thing that is! And then it got like twenty percent better mileage, and then suddenly, suddenly, all trucks look like that now. So, if you're going to come up with new technology and new ideas, just make sure they work. But people, like I say, are pretty conservative. They don't like to change too too quickly. Yeah, very true. Well, Jay, let's talk about a project that I believe that you've been working on for a bit. Um, and I think it's just behind you, the Firebird Sprint. Oh, yeah, yeah. That thing is great. You know, this is really interesting to me. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, John DeLorean uh, was enamored of the XKE. He just thought that was the greatest car. He wanted to build an American XKE. And he went to his bosses at General Motors, and they – well, eventually he built the Banshee. I don't know how many people remember that. That was a two-seater Pontiac sports car. But the trouble with it was it would have competed with the Corvette. And and his boss, the John Motors, said, said, look, build us something to compete with Camaro and Mustang and whatever. Uh, you know, so so they did the Firebird. But he still had this XKE thing in the back of his head. So he took the Chevy 6, uh, put a modified cylinder head on it, put an overhead cam on it, driven by a rubber belt. That was sort of the gimmick of the time. It was the first overhead cam production engine built in America since probably the Will St. Clair in 1922. And it had a rubber belt and a few other gimmicks. And it came with a quadrajet and a four speed. And they built a model called the Pontiac Sprint, which was 4.1 liter, six cylinder overhead cam engine. But the trouble with it is, by the time you put the quadrajet and the headers and all the high performance options on it, it actually cost more than a V8 Firebird. And back in 1967, 68, why would anybody take a six over a V8? It made no sense. So they didn't sell very money, many of them. So in the back of my mind, I looked for years until I found one. And I found one that's <clears throat> behind me. This guy had ordered it with all the performance options. He was a sailor, a four speed and a convertible. And I, so we Got a bit of retro mod to it. We put four-wheel uh, brakes, Willwood disc brakes on it. Uh, we put a Hotchkiss suspension, which is fantastic. The I, it's only 215, <clears throat> maybe 220 horsepower, but the emphasis is on the handling. I mean, it really handles like a sports car. We put the 15-inch wheels on it. I'm going to put a little thinner tire. They're a little too thick, and I'm hitting the wheel well when I, you know, come down from a over a, a whoopty doo or a bump or something, you know. Now there's some pictures of it there, yeah. That's being being done. But uh, we put a, a Tremec TS X in it, that new five speed. Boy, that is a great, <clears throat> great gearbox. You know, you don't realize how how 
you don't realize how good gearboxes are until you get a brand new one. You go, oh my God, this thing just snick, snick. But the real uh, thing I'm most proud of is the trouble with these cars was the oil pressure was kept deliberately on the low side because the rocker arms would soft and would, would wear the cam. So what we did, we, we made our own rocker arms out of tool steel. We had them hardened, and then we put a coating on called diamond-like coating. Uh, what is it called? DLC, I think his name is. Uh, and then we ran it on the dyno, <clears throat> just flat out, and we couldn't get anywhere on the rocker arms or the cam at all. And we realized, well, this is perfect. So that's what we have in it now. So the emphasis on this car is not necessarily the speed i mean it's it's a lot of fun it sounds like a six it makes a nice noise uh it just handles so well and that's what's sort of fun and when you go to a car show people go oh what do you got in there 400 no and they go what what because most people have never even seen that engine they only did it for a few years in the late 60s and early 70s an overhead cam pontiac six and it says see 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 the overhead gets it it's such a strange looking motor with that big big giant quadrajet on it so it, it it's a lot of fun and it, it's something a little bit different and i i really enjoy it i'm having a lot of fun with it. yeah you mentioned the rockers that uh, you guys had to basically build from scratch how what's how much fabricating do you do and is there something uh typically that on your restoration projects seems like it always needs fabricated because you can't find the part is there anything like that through the years? Yeah, that's sort of the problem. Uh, we have Fidel machines. We've got CNC machines. you got 3D printers. So we, you know, it's the old adage. You want something done right, you got to do it yourself. Like when I first got the garage, people would let me use it, their spray booth. And then, then the paint, then, then, you, then you paint your car and you realize ah, there's dust in the paint or whatever because the the paint booth is not clean and you can't get mad at people because you're using their booth. So we just put our own spray booth in and then we started to just do our own work. Right now we're, we're making a bell housing. I've got a, uh, a 1962 Maserati that I was able to buy a long time ago, pretty cheap. And that came with a five speed ZF gearbox. And mm -hmm. just, it, but the gearbox is, is in bad shape. The sink rolls are all gone. Just buying new gears, a couple of new gears for ZF is more than a brand new Tremec TXH, a THX rather. And the, and the, the, the Tremec gearbox is small, it's light, uh, but we have to make our own bell housing. So that's what we're doing now. We, we do designing it and cutting the bell housing. Now you start with a big chunk of metal and you, and you whittle it down. And uh, so we're gonna put that in there. And a lot of people say, oh, but it's not a Maserati anymore. Good, thank you. That ZF box was terrible. <laughs> so, this way it'll be drivable and it'll be fun and uh it'll be kind of cool so. excellent jay one car that that uh <clears throat> i absolutely love i mean your whole collection is awesome but this well, car thanks. in particular i think is amazing your 55 buick it's kind of the car that's been with you through everything oh yeah um, yeah can you tell us about that i've kind of you know heard stories about you sleeping in it when you were first starting well, Comedy. What it is, I, I flew to California and I got off the plane and I had no, I had no plan. I thought, what am I going to do now? I said, well, I need a car. So I was at the airport and I bought the Penny Saver. That was, I, that's like, uh, you know, one of these things where you just people have stuff, junk for sale. I looked at automobiles and I saw, uh, oh, 55 Buick, $350, uh, Westchester, California. And I thought, where is that? I asked him, what is it? The guy, oh, it's about four miles from here. Oh, good. So I got a cab. I took the cab to this house, and the Buick was there, and it looked okay. And I realized, well, if I don't buy this, I got to take a cab to the next next place. I said, well, I, 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 so I gave the guy the three, I'm a real, real good haggler. So I gave the guy the three, $50. And I said, okay, now I got a place to sleep. And okay. so I had that car. And it was great. It was a good running car. I enjoyed it. I met my wife in that car. I dated my wife in that car. I took that wife to my first Tonight Show. Uh, I took the car to my first Tonight Show. You know, and then I parked at my mother-in-law's house. And it often happens, younger, prettier cars came along. And that thing sat for like, it sat for 17 years at my mother-in-law's house. Wow. And, and, I went, and I went over to my mother-in-law's one day. And there was a note out saying, 
uh, somebody obviously doesn't care about this car. I would like to buy it. And I went, oh, no, I care about it. So I felt <laughs> terrible. So uh, we got a flatbed. We brought it back to the garage. I spoke to the guys at GM. We got the very first 572 crate motor, the very first ones. And GM made up some valve covers with my name on it, which is kind of funny, and I appreciated that. And uh, we put that in there. We put some C5 Corvette suspension in it. We made our own wheels, uh, and we spun some hubcaps to make it look original. So it originally had 14s in it, so it's got 17s in it now, so we can get the big brakes underneath there. So it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I love that car, and I'll never sell it. I've had it now. God, no more than 40. Almost 50. God, I've had it almost 50 years. I bought it in 72. <laughs> Is that the car you've owned the longest, Jay? Yeah, that's the car I've had the longest. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, That's the first car I got when I came to California. I didn't set out to collect cars. I just never sold anything, you know? So Yeah. <laughs> and I've got stuff here that's it's not worth anything to anybody. I just like them. I, like, I love Corvairs. I think Corvairs is one of the great innovative American cars, even though, you know, it's so funny. It showed you how times change. Corvair sold 1.8 million Corvairs and was considered a failure because Mustang sold like 2 million or 2.5 million or whatever it was. You know, and it just shows you, you sell 1.9 million now of anything and they make you president of the company. But yeah. back then, that was like, oh, no, that's not good enough. 1.8 million. That's terrible. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, you, you talked about you know the Firebird being something you're working on now, and and sort of the plan behind that uh, with the engine. Uh, how do you you know decide kind of what's next? Uh, I, you mentioned it doesn't always have to be fast. Maybe it's not worth something to anybody else, but you want to have it. How you, how do you decide and what is next? You have your eye on anything right now? Well, just fixing all the broken stuff is pretty much a full time job. We're doing a resto mod that we've been doing for the last eight years or so i've got a 1914 detroit electric and we put tesla power in it so you've got, you've got a 1914 car with with modern electric lithium-ion batteries air conditioning all kinds of modern things uh and uh i called my friend you know i have some the amish are great the amish still build wooden wheels you know they're wheel right and people don't realize that wooden wheels are extremely light and they're as strong as aluminum or any other wheel. And the Amish do a great job in this. And they may be brand new wooden wheels for this thing so it can take the torque and the power. And uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So that that's one project. What else? I've got a Doble steam car that we're redoing. Uh, that's another part. There's a lot of broken stuff here. so Because I drive it all and I use it all. Um, uh, I've got a, a Duesenberg back here with a, a loud, I got a valve sticking and I keep running sea foam and everything else through the motor, just trying to loosen it up. I don't want, I don't want to have to take the head off this thing. So I'm just trying to drive it and see if it frees itself. It's not terrible. It's just ticking. It, you know, it drives you crazy. It's like, uh, it's like that, uh, you know, the telltale heart at Grell and Poe. I can hear it. Nobody else can hear it, you know, yeah. so just little problems like that. Yeah, so so you have an Amish guy that's for cars, not barns. It's it's cars. That's that's interesting. Well, cars are motorcycles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, Jay. Uh, we've had a lot of our customers ask when we uh, we put the notice out that we we're going to be talking with you today that they're curious if you could only and this is probably a really hard question if you could only keep one of your cars or one of your motorcycles, what would it be? And I, I thought, wow, I, I, I don't know how I'd answer that question. So how, how do you, what do you think? Well, luckily we don't live in communist China, so I don't have to make that point. <laughs> I, can, I can have as many children as I want. I got to make other, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's so funny. People would say, oh, if I, I, if I only have one car, oh, I want it to be my 55 Goldwing. And they go, yeah, but it's your only car. So when you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot and you got to pick up some lumber that the gull wing is really not going to work for you. You know, you're going to need something kind of, you know, something pretty, pretty practical. So I, I don't know. I don't know what it would be. It, it, I mean, I, I, boy, it doesn't, I mean, I like them all. I, I guess if I have to pick one greatest American car, 
I'd have to go with the Duesenberg because the Duesenberg in 19, all Duesenbergs were built in 1928. And they were 420 cubic inches, four valves per cylinder, twin cam. I mean, just an amazing motor making 265 horsepower at a time when 30 or 40 horsepower was considered a lot for a car. I mean, it was the first, I guess, supercar, you could say. It wasn't until the, uh, the Hemi engine of the mid-50s came out that the Duesenberg was finally surpassed. And the Duesenberg, with the supercharger on it, was 320 horsepower in 1930, which was just inconceivable. So if I had to keep one, it would be that because the Duesenberg is one of the few, quote, antique cars you can actually drive every day as a modern car. It's got four-wheel brakes. Um, it's extremely robust. The chassis weighs 4,400 pounds. So you can't, you can't bend this thing. You can't break it. You literally have to wrap it around the tree at 80 miles an hour to do any damage to it. Uh, so I, I would have to say probably, uh, probably the supercharged Duesenberg Murphy Roadster. That would be the one car I would. If I could only drive one in your communist world, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> what about motorcycles, Jay? Do you have a favorite motorcycle, or do you have well, one that really I like, stands out? I like Bruff Superiors, and I like Vincent Black Shadow. I, I'm sure most of our viewers have heard of the Vincent Black Shadow. Many have not heard of the Bruff Superior. The Bruff Superior was the first superbike. It was the first bike guaranteed to 100 miles an hour. Uh, they had a JAP engine. 1,000 cc overhead valve. Uh, Bruff Sapiers were made famous by Lawrence of Arabia. He had seven of them. He died on the seventh one before he had time to pick up his eighth one, which he had just ordered. Um, incredibly fast, incredibly expensive. But Bruff Sapir in 1920 cost the same as, as a house in London, in England, rather. And it was, they were hand built and using proprietary parts. He got the best engine he could. Uh, Vincent, I give a little more credit to because he built his own engine, built his own frame, built his own uh, Bruff Sapir found the best parts he could, uh, made the best looking gas tank in, in motorcycle history. When you see a Bruff, it's, you know, it, to me, it's the most beautiful bike uh, you could possibly imagine. 19, especially one from the 20s, very spindly, very lightweight. 55 horsepower in 1920 on a motorcycle was unbelievable. I mean, it was just an unbelievable amount of power. And to go 100 miles an hour when the speed limit was 35, it would be like going 200 today. So uh, I would say the Vincent and the Bruff, but I've got a 36 Harley Knuckle, which is an interesting one, the Knucklehead. You know, the 36 Harley is interesting because when it came out, they didn't make very many of them because they thought it was too technically superior. Had overhead valves, had a four-speed gear change. Uh, had all these things which they thought mm, the average motorcyclist would find this daunting, you know. Flatheads were nice. They kept all the oil inside. They had a lot of torque. They were easy to run. They were easy to fix. You could take the head off and decoke it, no problem, you know, which is something you had to do in the early days because of the gasoline and the oil. You had to decoke the head every five or six thousand miles. Uh, so when the knuckle came out, it's funny to think of Harley being as too advanced for the period, but that was that was the fear at the time. Well, you have such a wide array of vehicles, motorcycles, cars, you know, everything. Is there one, uh, let's think in, in terms of engines, one that was most difficult to get a grasp on or learn uh, to, to work on? Uh, you know, so many different types of, the Duesenberg is pretty, I mean, the Duesenberg, even in the period flat rate manual, Adjusting the valves is a 40 hour job. <laughs> wow. It's 40 hours to adjust. Well, it's a full yeah. week of eight hours a day to, to do the valves on a it's, it's that complicated a motor. Um, yeah, there's so many. I've got an engine here, and it's a Bristol 403. It has a little six cylinder engine. If you looked at it, you think it was twin cams, but it's not. You've got a cam low in the block. You have one push rod comes this way, another push rod goes this way. So this push rod, so it goes to you have hemi head, you have a hemi head, 
and the valve on each side, and the valve should, it doesn't look like it should work, it should work at all, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of engineering. And to think all this stuff was designed before there were computers or any of that, just with slide rules and drafting paper. I mean, it, it, these engineers are pretty amazing guys. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, diversity, obviously. Now, is there something? What, I had a friend ask, what, what is the maddest you've ever gotten at a, a project or, or, or you know, something you're working on in the shop? Everybody gets frustrated. Is there something? It's that really, time you just got to walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I tell you that, well, I mean, that Bentley keyway on the uh, pulley that I mentioned that's on the inside of the cross member, that sat for 18 months. We just said, oh, God, I, I just didn't <laughs> want to. Do that. I mean, first of all, we need the whole shop because you'd have to take the, literally lift the body off it, take the fender. I mean, it was pull the engine up just, just to get, because even the fan belt, you can't put a fan belt on that car. You've got to have a hook belt, which means, a fan belt where you attach it, you, you, you put little pieces on to make it longer or shorter. You know, they, they hook at each end. Uh, so that that was a pretty daunting one. Uh, the Doble steam car is daunting because you've got, uh, you've we had to make piston rings and we, need, we needed 80 of them because you had three rings on each piston, there's four, then you had the valves had six or seven at the top, six or seven at the bottom. Because the way the steam engine works is uh, the valve opens and then then you've you, you got rings at the top of the bottoms. So, so it, 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 steam enters one area and then leaves the bottom area. And those all have to be sealed. Then you have to find somebody who make the piston rings for us. And of course the first set they made wrong, uh, you know, so it's, oh, it's, it's like, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. You know, you know, it's so funny. Like I did this firebird and I call year one and I go, Hey, I need this. Oh yeah, we got that. What? Oh, cause you know, I'm so used to these weird cars. So there are no parts where you have to make them or use the 3d printer. So to, to, to find suppliers, you know, even to do it, like here I'm wearing my, what have I got, my Fort Wayne clutch and uh, driveline t-shirt on because I love these guys because they're the only guys that can set up a Duesenberg clutch properly. I haven't found, there's nobody else, I haven't found anybody else in the world that can do it. And these guys, I send them my clutch and they send it back and I put it in and it's perfect. I can, I can screw that thing all day long and I can't get it right, but I send it to these guys. So when they send me a t-shirt, I wear it. So that's Fort Wayne driveline and clutch. So I, appreciate those. They know what they're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Jay, you mentioned earlier about events in 2020 getting canceled, appearances getting canceled, etc. Hopefully 2021 will be the year that we can get back to going to races, events, and shows. Right. What are some of the most memorable ones that you've been to where if, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of customers or car people, obviously, they always want to know what's the bucket list show that, that they should go to. So if you well, think you know, about all the things you've been to, what do you think? It's funny. I mean, I just like regular neighborhood car shows. You know, I went to one in Wisconsin because, uh, you know, Pebble Beach is nice, but it's, it's that's like millionaires fighting with millionaires. Uh, and, and they have nice cars, but they're sort of unattainable cars. I was in Wisconsin. I was doing a show, and I went to this one, and it was raining, and everybody showed up. And, you know, they're cooking brats in the tent and everybody's sitting around drinking beer. And I'm just talking to guys. I'm talking to just regular guys, guys in their 40s that are talking about when the kids get out of college another 10 years or 12 years, they're going to find a 57 Chevy or a 55 Chevy or whatever it might be. And it was just fun to just walk up there. I mean, I like all these other cars, but, it, but it's fun to just hang out with me. Like the car that won that show was a 66 Tempest with the overhead camp engine that this had in it. Nothing exotic, but just just different and well-maintained. Uh, the guy done a nice job restoring it. I mean, I like to go to shows where guys, I like to call them rattle can restorations, where guys you know, use some Rust-Oleum on the chassis and they restore it in their garage and they hand sand it and they 
And you know, it looks as good as one of those Pebble Beach restorations because there's so much effort went into it. You know, I, I really enjoy that. We have one here in California. It's a Latino event we call the Blessing of the Cars. And you know, Latino families show up with guitars and barbecues and the priest runs around and throws some holy water on all the cars. <laughs> Uh, but great people, great fun, different kinds of cars. I'm not a low rider guy, but I appreciate, you know, the workmanship and the paintwork on these low riders I see are just unbelievable. I mean, the level of detail is just amazing. This guy had this one with roses and flowers in the paint. I mean, you could literally put your hand into the paint, and he did it in his garage. And to me, there are just so many unsung geniuses and people who are really good at what they do out there that it, it, it's fun to see those people i mean we all know the the big restoration shop by name and stuff but to find these people who maybe they're a machinist in their real life or maybe they're a boeing engineer whatever it might be and they have these projects that nobody knows about that they come out with for local car shows that are just amazing yeah jay years ago we went to the uh the reno hot august night show which is uh, just just a fantastic car show. It takes over the whole city of Reno for right. almost yeah, a week. That. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a gentleman had a '64 Impala lowrider there. And if you if you know an Impala, and I'm sure you do, the the side trim all the way down the car. This gentleman hand engraved mm. all the side trim all the way down the car. It was incredible. I mean, you know, just the like, workmanship was amazing. So I can appreciate all kinds of cars, and it might not be my taste. I gotta admit, I don't get the little tiny deal thing. That doesn't work for me. The little tiny deal, I don't get that. But I can appreciate it, especially and these guys that do the hydraulics. Oh my God! I mean, the amount of pressure they're running through there. I look at the fittings; they're not weeping. There's 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 no leakage around the. I mean, it, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me the work these guys do. Yeah. So if you had a, you know if you're starting out in in the hobby and you had you know a, a like a 10 grand budget what where would, where would you start what would you look at uh we had a, actually had our fan actually ask that question well if i had a 10 grand budget i would look at a corvair because you can get a six cylinder with a four speed and you can buy you can still buy corvairs for 6500 bucks uh and you know people forget back in 1966 corvair beat porsche in the sc uh with it SCA Racing, you know, Sports Car Club of America, SCCA Racing. Uh, they, they won. Uh, I mean, Corvettes are a great car. It's, it's the most European American car ever built. You know, I have a 66 Corsa. And when I drive it, people say, is that a Carmen Gear? Is that a Fiat? No, it's a Corvair. Ah, what's a Corvair? Because they don't know what it is. And you open the hood, you show them that flat six, and they go, what? I mean, uh, they're a dime a dozen. Uh, it's not a particularly sophisticated engine but you can get a lot of power out of, and they're a lot of fun. So I would say that, I would say uh, a, a really overlooked car, although not so much anymore, 60, 63 Falcons. Mm -hmm. You can drop a small V8, a 260 or 289 into those, or uh, especially, the Sp I've got a 63 and a half Falcon that I love. It's got a 302 with a five speed in it. But I, I would say Corvair would probably be your best bet because you're, you're combining a little bit of sports car with a manual transmission, a uh, flat six engine that's air cooled. You don't have radiator problems, and overheating problems, and stuff like that. So I would say that's probably one of your best bets for under ten grand. Awesome, Jay. Is there any car that that you don't own that when you look back you think I am so glad I got rid of that, and I'm so glad I don't have it anymore? I never got rid of. It. I have every car. <laughs> I haven't gotten rid of any cars. Uh, well, what we do is um, every year we try to get, we try to find a deserving veteran or something and, and auction it off for charity. We'll do that. Um, I do have some I like better than others. Uh, uh, there are some cars you just want to drive them once. And go, oh, okay, that wasn't what I thought. A little that was a little disappointing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those classic cases. Sometimes you want to meet your hero. You know, it's funny. When you drive a mid-60s muscle car now, and you put your foot in it, you go, what is this? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know Tim Allen and I, 
we, we got a, what, what year was it? A 67 GTO tri-power automatic, three speed. And we said, let's pick the most pedestrian car we can find. So we got a Nissan Altima four door V6. We did a drag race and blew the doors off the GTO. I mean, it was like, it was so, de it was so depressing. I mean, the GTO was totally stock. Neither car was modified, you know, but you know what that show, slow shifting three speed. And, and, and the Altima, the Altima beat it. It was like, it was so de depressing to go, oh my God. You know, this is a car I dreamed about, really. Because you remember, when we were kids, zero to 60 and anything under 10 seconds was fast. When the Hemi came out, that was 6.3 to 60. I thought, that's got to be a misprint. Nothing can be that fast. Unbelievable, you know. But, yeah, I mean, we've come a long way, you know. In fact, speaking of that, I've got a 66 Coronet with a Hemi that I love because it's, it's pre-Roadrunner. It's just the first year of the Hemi and that boring taxi cab body. My wife thinks what a taxi cab. And when I got that thing, it had the three speed torque bike. And I would drive it and put my foot in it and I hit reverend and then it wouldn't shift. I said, What's going on? Why would it? And I would lift off so it would shift. And I'm thinking, God. So finally I found a transmission guy and I said, Do you know torque flights? He goes, Yeah. I go, This thing is not shifting. He goes, What are you doing? I said, well, he said, just take it on the road and keep your foot in it. I know, but it's not shifting. He said, just keep your foot in it. It'll shift at about 73 or 7,400 RPM. Wow. All right. Uh, okay. So I got on the road. I put it And then I hear, and then, it, and then it, I leave a big stripper over a second. Oh, it is. Because the car had no tack. And it just sounded like I was going to blow it up each time. And that thing is more fun. To drive that stupid with drum brakes, no power steering. It's like, it's like it's the most Neanderthal car I have, but it's a, it's a Hemi with solid lifters and a torque flight, no power, anything. Drum brakes, you just sail through stoplights. Excuse me, sorry, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, but it's it's and my wife can't figure out why I like it. She goes, It looks like a taxi cab, it's green with dogfish hubcaps. And I go, honey, right there. See, it says Hemi. She says it says 426. She goes, well, I don't know what that means. I go, well, okay, I rest my case. Yeah. Mm. Now, do you still take most of the cars out? And which ones get the most second looks, uh, your second glances when you're, when you're driving along? Oh, oh let's see. Uh, well, usually the, uh, the steam cars, people kind of freak out. I have I have a 1980 Stanley Steam is the oldest car ever stopped speeding on the 405. Like I was, the car is made of wood. And yeah. here's what you do on a Stanley Steamer, okay? When the car catches fire, which it often does, they tell you to shut off the fuel and increase the speed to blow out the flame. So I'm going on the freeway and I see flames coming over the hood of the car. So I go, okay, so I shut off the thing and increase the speed. Now I'm doing 91 miles an hour, and a cop pulls up next to me, just screaming at me. He goes, oh, we're all right. I go, I'm trying to blow out the fire. Blow out the fire. So now, <laughs> now the fire blew out, and I pull over, and he's all set to call the fire department. I go, don't call the fire department. This is under 600 pounds of pressure. You hit them with an ax. You're going to go scald yourself to death. He goes, what do you think? I explained to him, no, that's what you're supposed to do. He goes, okay. Well, well take it easy. I said, okay. Well, yeah. I'll let you off with a warning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Jay, what, uh, do you have any cars that are left on your list that you, you look at and say, uh, you know, I, I got to find one of those. I got to kind of somehow locate that. And uh, and maybe you don't want to share that with us. You don't want to drive the price of them up. So I understand no, no, that. No, no, no. I always say be happy with what you have. Just make sure you have enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, you know, this Sprint was one of those cars. You know, it's so funny because I, when I was a kid, like kids now, when you go on the internet, you can have whatever you want, whenever you want it, at your disposal. But when I was a teenager, you waited for those monthly car magazines. You waited, like in August, you knew the September issue would have the new Corvair or the new Corvette or the new Mustang. And you never saw a picture of it until you got that magazine in your hand. So, now, so there was always that anticipation. So 
when you live in Andover, Massachusetts, like I did, any car with less than four doors might as well be a Ferrari. I remember a guy named Joe in our town had a 55 Chevy with a 283 with two four barrels. Well, that, that was an Indianapolis race car as far as we were concerned. I mean, that was the fastest car in town. It was unbelievable. And, you know, it was the kind of thing where you go to McDonald's at 8 o'clock at night, hang around, wait for something cool to come by. You go home at 10. When you got home, the phone would ring. Hey, a new Corvette came in. No, oh, I missed it. No, oh, you know, you know, it was just, it was just a different sort of era, you know. So, I, 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 I do tend to like the ones I missed. I, I thought I would never achieve. Uh, one car. I worked in a Mercedes dealer when I was a kid, and I got to drive the 6.3 Mercedes which at the time was the fastest four-door sedan in the world. I remember Don Garlicks had one, the drag racer, and uh, he just gushed over it. It, it. But at the time, it was $14,000 when a Cadillac was 6500 maybe. And I thought, oh, man. And I, 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 my job was I was the lot boy. I would put license plates on, you know, and clean it and get it ready for the customer. And, and I would get to drive them around the building or whatever it might be. And I just thought that was the greatest car in the world. So that's a car I bought when I made some money. I, I tracked one down and I found it. But I don't know whether it's the greatest car or if it's just the greatest car because it impressed me as a young person, you know? So it, it, it's funny. It's funny how that works. It just leaves an impression in your mind. Yeah. Jay, uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, Tim Allen. And obviously, you know, we, we love Tim Allen. His shows are great. He's a car, yeah. car guy like yourself. What's it like to work with him? Oh, Tim's a lot of fun. You know, we've known each other. We all start. Actually, I'm a little older than Tim. So I was thought of on TV, I think, before Tim. So I knew him when he was a young comic, you know, just just a guy trying to make it, you know. And he's a great guy. Very knowledgeable, very smart, has a wonderful collection. Uh, he tends to skew American. You know, he like, he's, got a, he's got a 409 Chevy that I love. He's got a, a, what year is that? He, he's got a, uh, an early Ford. Maybe it's a 52 uh, with a, the, the GT40 drivetrain in it, which is fantastic. He's got all kinds of great stuff. Uh, no, I love, uh, I, love, uh, I love Tim. And he does. He really, he really knows his stuff. He, he grew up in Detroit. Uh, he used to race on Woodward Avenue when he was a kid. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's very knowledgeable. Very good. Yeah, you, you obviously very well known uh, car guy. And you mentioned hanging out with some of the the everyman at some of these uh, like shows in Wisconsin, you know. But obviously, you get to to work with some celebrities on these cars too. Is there anybody that would really that you were really surprised to find out was was a car person or is really knowledgeable that you didn't expect? Uh, Kevin Costner. He's got a he's a Mustang guy. Who else? I, I'm trying to think. Well, Seinfeld. Seinfeld's of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Porsche guy, uh, a lot of people, uh, John Hamm, uh, you know, we do a thing called stump a car nerd where we, we blindfold people and uh, we take them for riding cars and they have to try and guess what it is. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, there's quite a few, I mean, uh, cars is one of those, uh, secret passions. A lot of people have, they don't talk about, but yeah, that, that, that's one of it. Yeah. That, there's quite a few out there. I'm trying to think who else comes to mind. Uh, oh, um, Idris Elba, he's a huge car. Hmm. Uh, who else? Uh, I, I mean, there's so many. I, 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 there's so many I'm forgetting. Right. Yeah. Well, Jay, if you ever happen to talk to any of them and you say, hey, those guys at Summit like talking about cars, and if you ever want to jump on a, uh, a live stream with them, we'd welcome that opportunity because there's sure. a lot of fascinating people that have uh, incredible collections, like you mentioned, that uh, sure. would, would be a lot of fun for our customers to get to know. Roger Penske, there you go. That's a good one. That would be fantastic. Yes. That would be incredible. You know, he's a great guy. You know, I was I was with Roger, and he's, he's a very self-effacing guy. And he and I drive around Detroit, and we're in downtown Detroit. And I said to him, "I'm stunned at how clean downtown Detroit is. I thought it's all such a trash and garbage." I mean, everything looks nicely taken care of. They've really done a wonderful job. And he started a program where, I think I have this right, he gives homeless people a mailbox with a key, 
so they have an address where they can get mail or they can get checks or whatever like that. And he sets up some kind of food banks around. And all he says to them is, hey, if you're out in the city and you see some trash, you just put it in the trash can. You don't have to, but if you would, I'd appreciate it. Hmm. It's not a piece of trash in downtown. Hmm. I mean, I was, I mean, to the point where, I mean, I had to drag that out of him. I didn't, I was just talking about how clean it was. And then he told me about this program. It's not like he was, you know, trying to brag to me about something he did. And I, I was stunned about it. And I just thought, well, what a great idea. What an interesting way to give people some dignity and yet, you know, accomplish something of making the city cleaner and a safer place. So, yeah, he, he's, he's, and of course, he's the ultimate car guy. He's my defense guy. Yeah, he's been an amazing American success story. Very, very true. Just just like yourself, Jay. I mean, it really is amazing what uh, over the years you accomplished. When when uh, back when you were a young stand up comic, did did you ever think that you'd you'd be at the place you're at now? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> never. No, I was just lucky to be making a living. Doing jokes. Great joke, tell joke, get checked. That was the thing. If I could pay my bill <laughs> and take care, that would be great. You know, no, I know it ne never even occurred to me, but which was, which is, I think, a better way to be. You know, I was always happy at whatever level I was at. I was always happy that that's fine, you know, uh, because I, I enjoy life. I, 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 I'm realistic. I, I was a terrible student. I'm dyslexic. I never thought I would get this far. And so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a huge believer in low self-esteem. I think if you don't think you're the smartest person in the room, you'll shut up and you'll listen. I mean, I have guys here that are excellent machinists and excellent mechanics, and I dabble, but when I break it, they step in and they fix it and they do it properly. So the idea is to know your limitations. I mean, I like to write jokes and do stuff like that. I like to play with cars. And when I get it over my head, which is every day, the guys jump in and save me. I don't like, I don't want to pretend that, oh, well, I got restored all these cars myself. Not, not even close. I've got guys here that are excellent at what they do. And it, it's good. We have a good life. Nothing here has to be done on any particular schedule. The guys work when they want. They can work on their own cars when they want. Everybody's got full 100% insurance, you know, and it's just a nice, relaxed atmosphere. But uh, I mean, all the credit goes to them. All the paint work, body work, CNC work. You know, as I said, I'm dyslexic. I, I, I sit there with a computer and I'm, what? What? You know, I go to Vegas and they go, sir, you have 28. What? I don't have 21. No, I have 28. <laughs> oh, so sorry. Yeah. Uh, please leave the table, you know. So, yeah. So, no, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Very good, Dave. You have any other other topics? We want to be respectful of your time, Jay. We could we could talk all day if we could keep you for that. But yeah, no, just any advice for somebody just get just getting into this hobby, uh, starting out, and uh, maybe something maybe you learn the hard way along the way. I think the, the best advice is buy something that you can afford. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of times guys will get a project where they're just way in over their head. You know, if you're a young person, you. You know, I'll give you an example. When I was in the Tonight Show, I had interns. And one of them said, I'm a slot, I'm a car guy. Oh, hey, nice to meet you. And we're talking, you know. I said, do you have any classic cars? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, what do you have? He goes, a 91 Miata. It just made me laugh because to me, that's a new car. But he was only 20 years old. So that car was one. Right. He was one, rather, when that car came out. You know, so it just made me laugh. Uh, you know, oh, okay. So to me, stuff like that, uh, high schools don't really have vocational training anymore, which is kind of sad. I hate to see that go. You know, I have a friend of mine, he runs a transmission shop and he makes money like a Hollywood producer because there's nobody else can do what he does. You know, he gets in there, he fixes the stuff. Uh, I'm a great believer in working with your hands and, and you know, learning a trade, you know, welders, machinists. I have great respect for these guys. Um, so, but that wasn't the question. The question was advice for them. Yeah, buy what you can afford and, you know, and find an old guy. Because there are a lot of old guys like me out there that know way more than I do. 
and would love nothing better than to pass this knowledge on to to young people. You know, I mean, if I was running car shows around the country, I would ask old guys to come in and because you know a lot of times young people come at me and they're bad. They go, Mr. Lano, what exactly is a turbo? I know the Porsche turbo is better than the regular, but why? What is the turbo? Oh, okay. And I don't give them a smart ass answer. You say, well, here's what it does. Oh, okay. Because if you don't know, you don't know. You know, if your dad didn't know how to use a screwdriver, chances are you don't know either. So find someone who does. But there are a lot of these guys. Like here at my shop, I always try to hire really older guys because A, they're not going to go out joyriding and picking up girls. <laughs> and, and they love having somewhere to go. There are so many retired Indy car mechanics, all these guys would love nothing better than to help a young person get a car back in shape and get it running again. You know, it's just a matter of maybe uh, you guys should set up some sort of website where you could hook people up or guys could, could, could meet to just exchange car knowledge, something like that. Uh, because I, are, I I hear from people all the time. It's not, I would love to work in your garage for free. I was with an Indy car team for six years, blah, blah, blah. I have nowhere to go on Wednesday afternoons or whatever it might be. And there's just a lot of these guys out there, and they would love nothing better than to meet a young person who doesn't know anything and, and teach it to them. Jay, I, I love that idea, and I'll talk to you offline about that because Dave and I have had uh, – had some conversations about something related to that, but I yeah. love the idea. I think all of us have been lucky to meet people in our lives that have given us uh, uh, education and passed on the knowledge that they have. And exactly. uh, I agree with you. I think that's an important part of the hobby and part of what makes the car hobby fun. I mean, you think all the people you've met over the years that have right. helped in one way, shape or form. So, well, Jay, we really, really appreciate your time well, today. Thanks, we love your respect for it. It. I'd love to keep you here all day, but I know you got cars to work on and things to do. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, loved having you. Thank you. And I uh, just want to send a shout out to our friend Brian, who works with us at Summit. He's normally here helping us host these events. He's sick today, though. Regretted. He, he said, of all days to be sick. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Jay. Appreciate you joining us. Yep. And Summit fans, thank you again. If you've watched today, uh, like our page on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram. Thank you for being a customer, and it was our pleasure to have you here today. So thank you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching.